How y'all doing? Welcome back to another Bubby Golf video. I appreciate y'all for being here. Thank you. Thank you for tuning on in. I'm gonna be honest with y'all. This video, excuse me, I'm sorry about that. This video, I don't really even know where to start. We got so much to talk about. First thing I want to tell y'all though, obviously beginning this video off, I want to give each and one of you guys such a huge thank you and I want to show y'all so much love. I get, where's it at? Where's the joint at? Look at this joint, y'all. Look at this joint. We got the plaque right there. Bubby Golf, 100,000 subscribers. This this plaque is not mine, though. This plaque is ours. The community we're building here, it's so beautiful. It's so uplifting. It's so positive. I appreciate y'all so much. And yeah, my camera's only got 29-minute recording limits, so we, we're going to have to... We're gonna have to get right into this joint. I'm Italian. I, <laughs> I could talk about anything and everything for hours. But, uh, yeah, I'm gonna be honest with y'all. Not feeling too hot today. Today's one of those days I woke up, just kind of felt like anxious the whole day. My tics and twitches have been pretty bad today. And for me, as I was sitting here driving home from the gym, today's like the last day I'd ever want to get in front of the camera when my tics and twitches are acting up or flaring up, whatever you want to call them. So to me, this is the kind of day where I make sure I get in front of the camera and I make sure to get something done that I don't particularly want to do. And, you know, take, take advantage of this day and look at these rough days as an opportunity to prove something to yourself. So when those good days come around, more often than the bad ones, you know what you're capable of. You get something big done on a day you're not feeling too hot, take on the world on a good day. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, yeah. I guess this is a video, that's what it's all about. I just want to be honest with y'all, open with y'all, vulnerable with y'all more than anything. It still feels surreal that I'm sitting here making this video. I'm not going to lie, in the moment, it is a bit overwhelming. Like, sorry. Overwhelming, like, I'm about to sit here and do pretty much a complete audit of my life up until this point. I, I've never really done that before. I've never done that with anyone before. And now I'm stoked and I'm mad excited to share this with y'all. And uh, yeah, real quick apologies as I'm looking around my room. It might be mad messy. We just got back from Dubai. But where, where else am I going to start with this video? Thank you to you guys. I told y'all thank you. I can't express how grateful I am for y'all and for being here and how blessed this life is. Thank you guys so much. Um... Another thing I have to say before we get into this video, quick disclaimer. You saw on the thumbnail of this video, I'm going to be talking about Tourette's addiction and finding my sobriety. And the overall message of this video, I want it to be on just the importance of mental health. But with speaking about addiction and finding my sobriety, in this video, I will be speaking about drug use and alcohol abuse. Now, if that is a conversation you don't want to hear or you have someone in the room who you don't want to hear that conversation just yet, I'd recommend turning the video off because this video is going to be real. It's about life. It's about my life and I'm going to tell you all everything in my life that's led up to this point. No hard feelings if you turn the video off. No offense taken. Uh, I still love you and I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day. But yeah, for those who are carrying on with me and want to hear the story, let's get right into it. I got a few more things I want to preface this video with. Uh, the first thing I want to preface this video with being the most important video I've ever made. Most important video I'm sure I'll ever be a part of because it's about my life. I want to dedicate this video and I want to take a moment to thank my mother and father, Kim and Rick Broders, back home in Chicago. I know y'all are watching this. You guys are wholeheartedly, without a, without a doubt in my mind, the only reason I am where I am today. When I was going through times in my life, blatantly throwing away my potential and wasting my potential, you guys pull me out of those times and made me realize my potential. <laughs> no matter what I put y'all through, no matter what I did, the mistakes I made, y'all never gave up on me, y'all never left my side. They know everything that's about to happen in the story, but y'all are about to hear about the things I put them through. No matter what I did, they always loved me unconditionally, and I can't express to them enough how much I appreciate you guys. Mom and Dad, you guys are the only reason I'm here doing this today, without a doubt. I know you guys want to give me credit for what I've done, but it's wholeheartedly because of you guys. And yeah, I just want to say before we get into the video, I love you guys. I appreciate you more than anything. You guys are my world. I love you guys. I got to stop rambling. We got to get going. Um, the second thing, well, I guess technically the third thing, I don't even know what number thing we are on to preface this video with is I want to tell y'all my story 
is nothing special, my story is nothing great, and that's why I feel compelled to share it. When I shared the video about my Tourette's, it seemed to have hit home and reached a lot of people who needed to hear it and who related to it. And that's the same thing with just my story overall. It's nothing special, it's nothing great, I'm nothing special, I'm nothing great. That's why I wanna share it because the things I'm about to talk about, the experiences I'm about to tell y'all about, what I've been through, the battles, the hardships I've faced, millions, thousands, millions of people go through every year. And yeah, I just hope this video is able to get out there and fall upon the ears of at least one person who it can help. Uh, I hope this video is able to bring light to someone who's going through a dark time. And yeah, I've been there. I know how much it meant to me when I heard other people tell their truth and heard other people talk about their stories and saying what they've been through and what they've battled and me knowing I'm not alone and not just knowing that you're not alone, but knowing that they've been here too and now they're there brought a lot of light to me during those dark times and it brought a lot of hope. And I don't have the opportunity to be that person to someone unless I share my story and make this video now made if y'all are watching this. And yeah, I just want to bring some light to y'all's days. That's it. I want to help at least one person just live easier. That's my goal in every day. I hope my content brings y'all joy. I hope it brings y'all serenity. And yeah, one final thing I want to preface this video with before we get into it is whatever you're going through, whatever you're battling, however dark the times may be or how deep the rock bottoms are, this too shall pass and it will always get better. I that that's You can click off the video after I tell y'all that, but that's all I want you to know. This too shall pass, it will always get better. I have been there before terrified that you're going to feel this way forever but I promise you you won't you won't it just you won't I promise you it will always get better this too shall pass I love you I care about you be here tomorrow and yeah I love you guys thank you guys so much for watching this video I know I'm rambling at this point it is tough to try and sit down here and all I want this to be first take one go I get everything out and say it so it's as genuine as possible I love you guys. I guess, yeah, let's, let's get into the story. I'm so excited. I can't believe like we're doing this right now. But I guess any story, life story, starts with where you were born. I was born in Barrington, Illinois, April 16th, 1997. Raised and lived my whole life in the same house in Palatine, Illinois. Shout out P-Town, Chicago, Northwest Suburbs. How you doing? But uh, yeah, as I go through and tell y'all this story, I'm really just going to talk about the times in my life where I learned the most and share that with y'all. And obviously, the points in my life where I've learned the most have been the hard times in my life. But starting out, ever since I was a little kid and I could walk up until my senior year of college, I did manual labor my whole life. My dad uh, ran a one-man heating and air conditioning operation. I helped him move water heaters, furnaces, air conditioning units, everything I helped him out with. And yeah, my grandfather and uh, my grandparents owned a greenhouse and a mini storage. So ever since I was a little boy, I'd go up there carrying one piece of firewood, trying to help out any way I could. But my whole life I was laying sod, moving firewood, laying mulch, mowing lawns, caddying, moving heaters, air conditioners, water heaters, furnaces, everything. And that is, now that I look back on it, one of the things I'm most grateful for in my early childhood and growing up doing that is because working with your hands and doing manual labor, you learn a discipline and you just learn things about life you'll never learn anywhere else. You ain't going to learn those joints in the classroom. I hated it in the moment. Oh, the amount of times my dad and I would argue, <laughs> dragging me out of bed to go to work. But yeah, I appreciate it all now. I am very grateful for those experiences. And uh, yeah, where else we got to go here? Where else we got to go here? So that's that. I just jump right into the juicy part of the story. You know what I'm saying? What is it? What is there to start out with? Obviously, before I did this, I thought in my head like, yo, I'm going to say this. 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 But you get here and sit here. You got so much to talk about. <sighs> Let's just jump right to. Actually, I got a funny story I'll tell you all about drinking my senior year of high school. Senior year of high school, before I got my fake ID, I wanted alcohol. Me and my buddies wanted alcohol to chill and drink, obviously. 
So <laughs> there was a liquor store about a quarter mile from my house. And when my dad would go to bed, I would go downstairs. I would take this red Budweiser work jacket he had. I'd throw it on. I'd throw on work jeans. I'd throw on work boots. And I'd throw on like a work hat. And I'd go outside in our front yard. I'd take some dirt, put some dirt on my face. And I would go in before I went in. I would pack the fattest lip you could imagine. And I'd go in the store with my spitter. <laughs> Acting like I just got off work. I am a 17 year old in high school, but for three weeks They fell for it and they sold to me and they would I would always go up. I'd grab a fifth of Jack Daniels <laughs> Set it down on the table. We got nifty. To, we got nifty to get alcohol back in the day, but yeah and Then we come home we get hammered drunk That's story number one. Obviously, that's just a fun story to get into it Let's move on I guess I'll tell y'all, this, this video, just a heads up, it is going to be real. I'm going to tell y'all about what drinking did to me, what I did while I was drunk. I'm going to tell you guys about all that. I mean, in high school, I didn't think I had any problem. I couldn't see it. My parents could see it from a mile away. In high school, I was getting so drunk and decent all the time my senior year to the point where I was pissing my bed, puking in my sleep, puking on the bed. And I just thought, I'm a high school senior going to college. This is normal. I didn't think anything of it too much. Wasn't ruining my life just yet. And that was the way I just carried on. And then I'm trying to think. I'm trying to gather my thoughts together to make sure the story goes together right. We'll save drinking to talk about in a little bit. But yeah, in high school, my parents saw the early signs of alcoholism and me just not being able to control it. Anyways, going into my freshman year of college, now that I'm about to talk about it, I'm starting to tick and twitch, but going into my freshman year of college, I don't know what it was, but that summer leading into my ticks and twitches ramped up. They became a lot worse than they were. Uh, my whole life, I knew I had ticks and twitches and everything since fifth grade is when I first started to notice them, but going into my freshman year of college, I really started to tick and twitch a lot more the frequency of them ramped up the magnitude of them and you know it's tough you're going into this new social environment where you got to f i also went to school where i didn't know anyone so i'm going in this new social environment i want to make new friends create a new friend group find my social life and everything and god whether you call it life i called it god he had other plans at that moment in time in my life and he's like here you go all that happens for a reason, though. I wholeheartedly, I wholeheartedly believe when you're going through tough times, the tough times in your life, God is forging you in the person you're meant to be, making you a stronger person to walk this earth. But, uh, yeah. And so, going to my freshman year of college, that really took a toll on my mental health. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. You probably won't be able to understand it unless you have Tourette's or a tick disorder or twitches. But I was so insecure and so self-conscious about them. When I was sitting in class, I would use all my mental, mental energy to resist my tics and twitches. And it is mentally exhausting. It is, one of the, it is just miserable to try and sit there and resist them because I was so insecure about them, so self-conscious about them that my education took a toll. Because I was sitting there in class and when I should be paying attention to the teacher, taking notes... I was using all my mental, mental energy to not tick or twitch because I thought people were judging me. That's how insecure and self-conscious I was about this. And not only that, I realized, again, I get very drunk. I get intoxicated. I don't feel the ticks and twitches as much. Not that I don't feel them. Well, I don't feel them. They're still there. But the insecurities and the self-consciousness of it all just... Just a boom, just washes away once I got blackout drunk. I don't gotta feel that bad stuff no more. Escaping reality, you know, you know what it is. So my freshman year of college, I was already getting drunk six or seven days a week, like drunk, drunk. Education took a major toll from the combination of the unmanageability of my drinking, complemented by trying to not tick or twitch in class. And I ended up having to change majors because I was doing so poorly in my classes. I changed to urban and regional planning. Loved it. I absolutely enjoyed that major. But the worst part of it all was it took such a toll on my mental health. This was my first bout with mental health. This is where I finally realized like, what you hear about in high school or you hear about in seminars and everything. This is my first time realizing, like, damn, this is what this feels like. And I don't know if I've even ever told my parents this, y'all, but... 
I'm here to be open. I'm here to be real. I'm here to be vulnerable. My whole freshman year of college, first semester and second semester, every night when I'd go to bed, I would pray to the Lord and I would ask him, it got this bad. I would ask the Lord, dear Lord, let me wake up without twitches or don't let me wake up at all. It took such a toll on my mental health, it got to the point where I'd rather not be here and deal with these insecurities and the anxiety and everything around it instead of ticking and twitching. Yeah, I've never, I don't think I've even ever told my parents that, y'all. But that's what it got to. And that's my truth. And that's how I felt in that moment in time. And I found a way to take my Tourette's and everything about it. And I now look at it in the current moment in time as one of the most beautiful things about me. I took something that was so negative in my life and turned it into something beautiful because it makes me unique. It makes me who I am. And not only that, I made that video about Tourette's and it got such a beautiful response from each and every one of you. I took that and turned it into something beautiful. We turned it into something beautiful. But yeah, that was my freshman year of college. All freshman year, every night, I'd, I'd pray that same thing. It was a rough time in my life, but now I look back at it in hindsight where I'm at now, and I thank the Lord every night for those times. <sighs> That's a tough one. Uh, let's keep going. I guess we'll talk now more about drugs and alcohol. Uh, alcohol, abusing alcohol. My whole summer leading into college, my first, my whole summer leading into my freshman year of college, all freshman year of college abusing alcohol. Second semester, my freshman year of college, I find this drug called cocaine. I try it for the first time again. I realize these insecurities, being self-conscious, everything. I just, I get to run away from my problems, escape reality, gone. I don't feel any of that bad stuff anymore. When I was high on cocaine and very intoxicated. Luckily, cocaine wasn't really accessible to me my second semester freshman year, so I had only did it a few times throughout all my freshman year of college. Go home, summer at home, I don't have access to cocaine, but I'm drinking all the time. I, when I got home, even like over breaks, like Christmas break, spring break and everything, when I would go home, I, if I didn't have a ride somewhere at night, I wouldn't go hang out with my buddies because I'd rather get drunk alone in my room. So if I never ride somewhere, you knew where I was. I was sitting in my room by myself drinking. And I don't mean just like drinking a couple beers, having a good time, watching sports with my dad. I mean like, no, every time I drank, I couldn't control it. And I drank to brown out, black out, drunk. Can't tell you why. I was an addict. I had a problem. And yeah. But anyways, keep going. Oh my gosh, I missed one of the most important parts of the story. My very first weekend at college, freshman year, very first weekend, syllabus weekend, I was arrested. Yeah, so right there, right off the bat. I thought I was losing my scholarship before school year even started. Funny story, I tried handing the officer. I was trying to be smooth and suave. You know, like, when you're getting arrested and you're intoxicated, you think, oh, I'm going to talk my way out this. Uh, I handed the officer my fake ID. That don't work with officers. So, uh, yeah, I got arrested. Luckily, didn't lose my scholarship, didn't learn my lesson in the slightest, carried on doing the same thing all my freshman year. And now fast forward to summer, still drinking way too much, drinking a lot. Anyways, come back to school my sophomore year, feeling a little bit better, not as insecure, not as self-conscious about the tics and twitches, but I still, I, I'm an alcoholic. I'm an addict. I love alcohol. I don't know why. I couldn't control it when I drank it. And now we come back my sophomore year, obviously drinking again all the time, but now cocaine is much more accessible. And when I was there in the current moment in time, my life didn't feel insane. And I think part of it that was really messing me up was I was really living off my laurels. I thought to myself, I can't be an addict. I can't be an alcoholic. I have a full ride academic financial aid scholarship to college. Oh, forgot to tell you all that part too. I got the Chick Evans scholarship to college. And yeah, so this is what I'm doing all the time, almost every day, my sophomore year of college. Definitely, I, I literally think I probably drank every day my sophomore year of college. And not just like normal drinking, but like drinking, drinking until brownout, blackout. My sophomore year of college, I was pissing the bed like two to three times a week, puking on my bed. 
but I was making grades and I was passing my classes, so I thought it was all right. So that, that happens all throughout my sophomore year of college. Come home, between my sophomore year of college and my junior year of college, I'm still doing the same stuff. But cocaine, I didn't have access to it back home in Chicago, but I was drinking every night to brown out, blackout drunk. I literally, it ruled my life. I couldn't do anything without it. I didn't go anywhere without it. Like I said, same thing still. If I didn't have a ride somewhere, I wouldn't hang out with my buddies. I would stay home alone and drink in my room and watch YouTube. And yeah, so halfway through the summer, I get arrested the second time. And this is a moment in my life where it really hit me like, okay, something's got to change here. And a story, me and my buddies, we were up on the lake. We were up at my grandparents' lake house. The boat was docked. Well, we were driving around fishing all day, drinking beers. We brought a 12-pack out, so we were going to have four beers a guy. Me, I decided I want more. So I drove the boat up to a dock, got off, literally walked a mile to the nearest gas station, bought a 24 rack of Miller Lite, walked it all the way back a mile, made my buddies wait by the boat while I did that, and I proceeded to get hammered drunk on the boat. I probably had about 17, 18 beers that day, and we're sitting on the boat about 300 yards away from uh, my grandparents' dock, and <laughs> it's Monday. There's no one on the lake. Uh, the cops roll up. They're just doing their normal checks. It's a sheriff's boat. <laughs> And this is, y'all are going to get a kick out of this one. I promise you that. And uh, the cops roll up and they're like, fire extinguisher. Pull out the fire extinguisher. Here you go, officer. He's like, all right, this is expired, but whatever. We don't really care. Put it back. <laughs> and they're like, life jackets. Three men on board. Show us three life jackets. We've been throwing, like stashing away our empties <laughs> in the life jacket spot. And keep in mind, we're on a 14-foot John boat. Nothing special. 20 horsepower outboard motor on the back. I open it up and I pull out the first life jacket and crook, 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 beer cans just fall everywhere in the boat. <laughs> my eyes light up. I look at my buddies. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and the cop, the cop looks at me. He's like, you've been drinking today, son. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, oh no, sir. Uh, my dad and his buddies were out on the boat last night. <laughs> Those are theirs. And the cop's like, oh really? Get over here. You effing idiot. And so he's like, I'm going to do a few tests on you to see if you've been drinking today. I'm like, okay, sir, sounds good. He does the eye test, the zen, 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 zen. Sure enough, I fail. I'm highly, I'm pretty intoxicated at that point. And he, he asked me, he's like, son, do you mind stepping over onto my boat? I'm going to do a few more tests over here. And this is where it got real. I asked him, I said, am I being detained or am I under arrest for anything, officer? Because I think in my mind, I know the rules and everything. He's like, he's like, yes, you are currently under arrest for an OVI. It's like, it's either an OUI or an OVI on a water vehicle. So I step over on the boat. I'm handcuffed. I'm sat down. Well, I'm not handcuffed yet. I go on to do the rest of the tests. I don't pass. I then get handcuffed. And after I pass the test and he tells me I'm under arrest, I told him I'll blow, I'll breathalyze at the station, and he's going to take me to the station. And so his partner's manning the boat. And once he says that, and I'm sitting there handcuffed at the front of the boat, I start bawling my eyes out. I am absolutely terrified. There goes my scholarship. I lost it all again because I decided to drink and put this substance inside my body. So I'm crying, bawling my eyes out. My whole life's gone. Future's gone. Scholarship, gone. And he came up to me, and he got down on his knees. He's like, why are you crying? You got something to lose, son. And I said, yes, sir, I do. I have a full ride scholarship I'm going to lose because of today and the, and the decisions I made. And he was like, what's a scholarship for? And I said, oh, it's a scholarship for caddies. It's a financial aid academic scholarship called the Chick Evans Scholarship. And when I said the Chick Evans Scholarship, his partner manning the boat, I noticed his eyes kind of perked up and he looked over and he called his partner back. So his partner walked back. He whispered into his part in the arresting officer's ear for a few seconds, maybe 10, 15 seconds. And I'm wondering, what is going on? And he walks back up to the front of the boat, gets down on a knee. I still can't believe this, y'all. I had a guardian angel this day. And he looked me in my eyes and he said, son, you must have a guardian angel looking out for you today. Because my partner just told me he knows a few Evan scholars and he attested for y'all's character, y'all's work ethic, and everything you have to do to earn that scholarship. He held up the paperwork for the, for the arrest in front of me and ripped it up. 
And he's like, you're not under arrest anymore today, but we will just issue an underage drinking ticket. God, a guardian angel, someone was looking out for me that day. And sure enough, well, there's a funny part to the story as well, too. So he's, <laughs> he said, we'll, we'll give you a tow back into your dock. We'll tow you, we'll tow you back. It's only 300 yards. So he tosses the rope to my buddies. My buddies are on the boat. They tie it up to the front of the boat. He's towing us. And we go probably about 40, 50 yards. And the partner, the partner's like, he's like, this is the heaviest effing John boat I've ever towed. What do y'all have on that effing thing? And I look back, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and my buddies are sitting there like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not saying anything. Just don't move a muscle. We look back. My friends, my buddies on the boat didn't pull up the anchor. So this guy is trying to pull this 14-foot John boat, and our anchor is just down in the sand of the Fox Chain of Lakes. And so he's like, hey, dumb, pull up the anchor. And so they run over, do-do-do, quick as all hell, pull up the anchor, pull up the anchor, put it in the boat, sit back down, and he drops us off. They got a kick out of it. They thought it was so funny. The officers did. But yeah, there's that. That still didn't really hit me as a wake-up call. It woke me up a little bit. I still proceed to keep on drinking every night. Um... Gosh, I'm going to take a check real quick and see how long I've been talking. All right, y'all. Good thing I checked the recording limit on the camera there. We almost hit the 29-minute recording limit. I didn't even feel like I've been talking that much. But yeah, let's get right back into it. We left off at, I just told y'all about my second arrest on the boat. That is the summer between sophomore year and junior year of college. This is actually the summer where I finally decided my life. I need to make a change and I find my sobriety. But it wasn't because of this incident. The arrest wasn't enough to teach me my lesson. We'll actually jump to the night where I finally hit such a point of disgust I decided I needed to make a change. Uh, it was about a month, a month and a half after the arrest. My buddy's just having a bonfire, just a normal weeknight. I think it was a Thursday night, just myself, a few buddies having a bonfire, and I brought over a 24 rack of Miller High Life. Uh, I proceeded to drink, I think, like 14 or 15 of them. And I wasn't satisfied. I went into my buddy's parents' liquor cabinet, took out a bottle of vodka, proceeded to drink like half a fifth of I don't even know what vodka it was. And I just got absolutely hammered. To the point I couldn't even walk. I couldn't even form a sentence. I was just like a lifeless body drunk. And my buddy, trying to do me a favor, who was there that night, he lived about half a mile away from where the bonfire was. So my parents didn't have to see me. He took me to his house, and he, like, literally, I couldn't walk at all that night. He carried me pretty much a half mile to his house, he said. I don't remember anything. Got me to his house, and once he finally got me to his house, he was trying to get me to go inside to go to sleep on the couch in his basement, and I refused to go inside, and I was yelling at him, telling him I'm not going inside because I don't want to piss on your couch or I don't want to throw up on your floor. So I decided to lay down in his backyard and I was yelling at him, rolling around, throwing a hissy fit, saying, I'm going to sleep out here. If you're from Chicago, you're from the Midwest anywhere, you know how bad the bugs and the mosquitoes are in the summer. But that's not even the important part of the story. The important part of the story is why I was sitting there throwing my hissy fit, rolling around, yelling at him while he was trying to do me a favor. Sorry, he, he took out my phone and started to record me. And I wholeheartedly don't know if he didn't record me, I don't know if I would have been as disgusted as I was enough to the point to go to an AA meeting the next day. I woke up the next morning and I had a text from him and he said, look at your camera roll. And I open it up and I click on the video and the video is of me in his backyard rolling around yelling at him. And not am I just rolling around in the backyard, I'm rolling around in dog shit. And I don't know why, but looking at that video, I finally hit a point of such disgust. I was so disgusted with who I was becoming and who I became and what alcohol did to me. Not only that, as I'm sitting there watching the video, I am sitting in a pool of my own piss. I pissed the bed. So all this finally just compiled into a beautiful storm of I'm disgusted with who I am. 
I'm sick of feeling this way. I'm sick of living this way. And that's the thing. When you really look at it, I feel like human nature, you don't make major changes in your life until you really hit a point of just such disgust. And that was that moment for me. The morning after that night was that moment for me. And what finally put the icing on the cake is after I got out of bed, my dad was sitting there eating lunch at the kitchen table. I walked into the kitchen to grab some water. He didn't even look at me. I I went out on the patio where my mom was sitting. And as soon as I walked out, she was on the verge of tears because of the state I was in the night before. Uh, to give you all an idea of the state I was in the night before, uh, at 3.30 a.m., my buddy had to call my mom and say, come pick him up. He's refusing to come inside. So my mom woke up 3.30 a.m., got in the car, came and picked me up. My buddy had to potato sack me and throw me into the back of her car. And then as we got home, we didn't even go straight home. She actually started driving to the hospital thinking she should take me to the hospital to make sure I was an alcohol poison to the point where it was dangerous. And she decided she took me home. And when we got home, my father had to come out and throw me over his shoulder and carry me inside because my mom wasn't strong enough to get me inside. I couldn't walk at all under my own power. And my mom stayed up the whole night watching over me, making sure I didn't throw up or choke on my puke in my sleep. And I just felt so ashamed the next morning seeing how much I hurt them. And after I saw my mom on the verge of tears when she saw me on the patio, I walked back in to sit down at the table and get some food. And when I sat down, my dad got up. He went over to the printer, the computer, grabbed something, and he came back and set down in front of me a list of 98 meetings in 90 days. Didn't say a word, just put it in front of me. He took a cereal downstairs. And just everything that day happened so perfectly to become a life-changing moment. I got up, grabbed the piece of paper, went out on the patio with my mom, and we chose a meeting, and we went to it later that day. And we went to the meeting, and I listened to all the... It was an Al-Anon meeting, so family, loved ones came with. my mom, Well, the family and loved ones could come with. It wasn't a closed or private meeting. And <clears throat> I remember I listened, I listened to a lot of people talk, but the last man got up to speak, and I remember he said something, just... This simple phrase that stuck with me, and for some reason I heard it, and it just made sense. He said, he ended a speech of saying, do the next right thing. So simple, but it's not easy. And I heard that saying, and in that moment in time, it kind of dawned on me, like an epiphany of finally understanding the power of decision. Like, okay, everything you do in life is a decision. But the thing is, though, I didn't decide to be an addict. I didn't decide to be an alcoholic, but I'm here now. This is the cards I've been dealt. Now I get to, now I have to decide how to play them. I get to decide what I do next. I decide if I'm going to keep being a victim of this or if I'm going to decide to make a change and do something. I decided to make a change. And so I went to AA meetings every day for the next two weeks until it came time we had to go to Ragbri, Register's annual great bike ride across Iowa. And if you've done Ragbri or you know what it is, it's a bike ride across the whole state of Iowa. Uh, and it's essentially, it's a booze fest. It's 45, 30,000 people partying across the whole state of Iowa, biking every day for seven days. Great place for a newly sober young man to be. And I get there the first day, I see everyone around me partying. All these RVs are having good times, blasting music, getting drunk, doing all this. And the negative thoughts got the best of me. And I started thinking like, I'm 20 years old. I'm not even 21. There's no way I can do this. How am I supposed to stay sober going back to college? How am I supposed to stay sober over this week? Da, 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 da. And those thoughts got the best of me that day. And I went back in the van, in the RV. Parents had left. My buddy's parents had left and my buddy was taking a shower. My best friend. And I went into the fridge, grabbed out three minute lights, drank one real quick, drank the second real quick. And as I'm halfway through the third one, my buddy gets out the shower. And I just remember the look on his face. He was my best friend. He knew more than anyone aside from my family that I had a problem. 
he knew how good sobriety was going to be for me. And he just looked at me. I remember all the disgust and disappointment on his face. And sorry, I'm about to cuss here. But he said to me, he's like, we're really doing this shit again. And that's all he said to me. And he went back in the bathroom and changed. And I don't know why, but him saying that hit home with me. And I'm like, wow, you're really fucking doing this again. And I kind of just had a breakdown. I hopped on my bike. I biked straight to the gym and I started working out. That's like my escape. That is my <laughs> therapy. That is my release. And I went to the gym and started working out. But obviously you can't run away from it. I came back to the RV. I told my mom. She was very upset. They have AA meetings every day at Ragbri because they understand the environment it is. And I ended up calling my dad. And I expected him to be mad, livid. He wasn't. He was so understanding. My father, he's sober. He's been sober since I was two years old. He talks every week at meetings and goes to houses to help newly sober people and to help people get sober. He does so much for the community. So he understood exactly what to say to me and how to talk to me. And he called me back down. He's like, it's all right. So when you're faced with your next decision, do the next right thing. And that day was July 23rd, 2017, and I have not drank since then i got sober before i was 21 years old but yeah we proceeded to go through the rest of the week i biked all the way across the state of iowa didn't drink a thing haven't drank a thing since then it blows my mind to think i've been sober for over four and a half years now i think that is and yeah so we get done with the bike ride and now a real test is i'm going back to college and i think my parents are very nervous for me going back to college i went to miami university of ohio it's a big party school I get back to college, I'm newly sober. About, well, July 23rd, you go back to college, late August, I've been sober for a month. And we're not gonna beat around the bush, we're not gonna talk about no stupid stuff. Anyways, sobriety is going absolutely great, it's going beautiful. Y'all obviously know that, because I haven't had a drink since July 23rd, 2017. But one of the most powerful moments in my life happened at the beginning of the school year. It was sometime in early September. It was a Friday night, and this is when it really hit me about do the next right thing. And it clicked in my mind and it made sense. The power of decision. It was a Friday night. It was right after, it was a week after syllabus week, early September. And the music was blaring throughout the house. All the frat houses, music is blaring. Uh, High Street is all lit up. Lines around every bar door. And it's about 11.45 midnight. And I got up and I decided to go to the gym. I had a membership at Anytime Fitness. And about halfway through my workout, it finally hit me. I realized like, my first two years in this town, every Friday night, I was drinking my potential away. I was destroying my body. I was doing cocaine. I was just doing all the things you could do to throw away potential every Friday night. But this Friday night, I'm at the gym, building myself up, bettering myself, progressing, trying to be the best person I can be. And halfway through that workout, that power, like just realizing that it was just a decision I made to go do that instead of doing what I used to do, hit me. And it made sense right there how strong the power of decision is because that's everything in life. Everything in life's a decision. I'm deciding to make this video right now. You're deciding to watch this video right now. I'm deciding to wear this hat. I'm deciding to go get Chipotle after this. I'm, yeah, like everything in life is a decision and the decisions add up. And no matter how small or trifle the decision may be, just ask yourself, are you doing the next right thing and you will have a beautiful life. I promise you that. And in that moment in time, I finally realized what do the next right thing meant. Come home, it's now about 1.15, 1.30 in the morning. My sleep schedule is still not changed. I hop in the shower, third floor of the Evans Scholar House. I'm taking a shower and I get out the shower and we have, there's a whole wall of mirrors there and I got my towel around my waist, I got my dab kit in my hand and I see myself in the mirror. And it's literally like, I, I'm not, it's not like I'm looking at a stranger, but I'm looking at this new person. Pretty much all the bloating from the alcohol and doing the drugs is gone. 
I just look good, I look healthy, I feel healthy, and not only that, I'm just coming back from the gym on a Friday night while the whole house is blaring with music, people are partying, and I went to the gym. Not a lot, but that's the thing. You gotta take those little wins and turn them into something grand, and that's what I did that night. And this is, without a doubt, I think probably one of the most powerful moments in my life. I felt good about myself, I felt accomplished, and I hear all college going on around me, I just got back from the gym. I set my dob kit down. I put my hands on the sink and I look in the mirror. Just so proud of the person I see now. And I don't remember exactly what I told myself, but I do know for a fact I made a promise to myself. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, Tom, you did not go through all that. You did not battle all that to get to the other side of it and be anything less than what you want to be in this life. And I made that promise to myself. No one else knows about that promise but me up until today, I'm telling y'all. And I made that promise to myself. And I didn't know what I was going to pursue. I didn't know what I was going to be. I didn't know what I was going to do. But I knew that I wasn't going to be anything less than exactly what I want to be. And I, oh, it's such a powerful moment. And that promise stuck with me all the way up until today. I hold myself up to that standard. Fast forward to my second semester, senior year of uh, college. Well, also first semester junior year because I got sober, got everything together, started doing so well, started thriving because I got that drug, that substance out of my life. I was actually elected president of the Evans Scholar House, and I loved every moment of it. I had such a good time being president. I literally went from sophomore year being the last person you would ever think of being president of the Evans Scholar House to now being president of the Evans Scholar House, elected by my peers. Um, but yeah, something on my camera. Sorry about that. But yeah, uh, let's fast forward to second semester senior year of college. And that's when I finally realized what I wanted to make that promise be about. And that's when I started Bubby Golf. It was my second semester senior year of college because I made a promise to myself, I don't want to be anything less than exactly what I want to be. I'm not going to waste my time on this planet doing something that doesn't make me happy. I'm like, I want, I'm going to do golf videos. <laughs> a lot of people didn't understand it. A lot of people looked at me like I was mad, bad shit, bad shit, crazy. It's okay doesn't matter what they think. Let me tell y'all something though real quick. If they don't understand your dreams, that means you're doing something right. That's how I looked at it. To everyone out there watching this who's a dreamer, who's got big plans, got big ideas, got big things you want to pursue, I'm going to tell y'all one thing real quick and hear me out on this. Small-minded people will be intimidated by big thinking people. That's all there is to it. When you think big, you think outside the box, you're going to intimidate people who are too scared to go after their dreams and what they want. And they're going to try and hold you down. Don't let that be the case. Yeah. You got to go after what you want. You got to do you. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. Ain't no one out here going to judge you. I wholeheartedly believe, I forgot to mention this, but when it came to my sobriety, obviously going through sobriety, I understood me, myself as a man, I was powerless over alcohol, and I turned to God. I turned my will over to God to get sober. And I really rekindled my relationship with God through finding sobriety. And that's bringing me back to the other thing I'm going to say is you got to understand one thing. I wholeheartedly believe the only person that can judge you is God. So who cares what anyone else thinks? you got a dream. Go for it. Go get it. Small-minded people are going to try and keep you down. But if there's people trying to pull you down and there's people who don't understand what you're doing, that means you are doing the right thing. I promise you that. But yeah. So Bubby Golf started second semester senior year and we are here now but there's still one more part of the story i want to tell you all about and this is a very important one after i graduated college that first winter after i graduated college i kind of looked at getting alcohol and cocaine out of my life as a one-size-fits-all solution to everything and I was wrong. I was sadly mistaken. I thought that I was going to solve every problem in my life. I'm going to be happy from here on out. This life's just going to go up, 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 up. That ain't how it works. That's not the plan God had for me. That's not how life works for anyone. But that's a beautiful thing. When you go through tough times, that's God forging you and the person you're meant to be. And sure enough, that winter was one of the hardest times of my life. Uh, I just really had another 
really tough struggle with mental health. Uh, I was beaten down. I was just anxious about everything, and I felt just depressed. Depressed about everything. Well, I was suffering from depression. I didn't want to get out of bed. I was staying in bed until like 4 p.m., 5 p.m. every day. And then, as you know, in the winter, by the time I was getting out of bed, it was already dark, and it was just a terrible cycle. And my mental health just took a major toll. And this is something I don't think I've ever told my parents, but I'm going to tell it here now. We've already put it all out there. Might as well. Uh, I would go to Chipotle every day still once I finally got up. And behind Chipotle, there's a pond that we would ice fish at. And a decent amount when I go to get Chipotle and it's winter time. I would go up, I'd walk to the water, and I would stand there by the edge of the freezing cold water. And I would debate just wanting to jump in. And in my mind, in that moment in time with how I was feeling, I thought, feeling the shock and the pain and feeling everything that cold water would bring onto me would feel better than what I'm feeling now, or it would make me forget for at least a while about what I'm feeling now. And yeah, I remember one day, once it finally started to ice over, I walked up to it. And I thought to myself, I knew the ice wasn't safe. And I thought to myself, I could go out there and walk on it. And if I fall through, I have an excuse saying I was going to test the ice to see if it was safe for ice fishing. And I built up in my head this whole excuse because I just wanted to feel something else than what I was feeling at that moment in my life. And yeah, that's one of the biggest moments in my life where I meant what I said at the beginning of the video, I have been there before where you're terrified that you're going to feel this way forever. Happiness was fleeting at that moment in life. I didn't feel happy really once for months. It was just gone and ripped away from me. And that's how I felt. I, that's a big one for me to say, y'all. I can't believe I just said that. I don't think my parents know that, honestly. I'm going to be showing my parents this video, though, before I obviously release it to y'all. So they're not caught off guard by anything. But I've been there before to that point where I wanted to feel the pain of going into freezing water and falling through the ice instead of feeling what I was feeling in reality in real life. And the thing is, too, I am... That's one of my biggest blessings, obviously, from getting sober and everything is... There's no escaping reality when you're sober. There is no escaping it. And that is the best part about it is when you go through tough times in your life where you would want to escape and you would want to feel something different than what you're feeling, you have no choice but to face it. They're head on in the moment. And the only way you can make your reality better is by being in your reality. Your reality will never get better if you keep escaping it, escaping it, escaping it. You're just going to keep coming back to the same thing. But with being sober, I never had an escape. So with anything in my life, whether it's like the rough patch I was just telling you about that winter after I graduated, or whether it's just a rough day in general, I don't have an escape. I don't have the liberty of drinking something or snorting something anymore. I have to take that problem head on and deal with it now in reality. And it's, it's honestly such a blessing to not have an out, to just be like, all right, come on, life. We're doing this now. I, I got nowhere to run. Let's go. And yeah, but your reality ain't going to get better if you keep escaping it. That's, I guess, what I was trying to say there. Yeah. I don't think if there, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to share with y'all. Oh, there's one more story I want to share with y'all, actually. And this story comes with, actually, an image. Let me get it on my phone real quick. I want to share this with y'all, and I want to tell y'all this, because I want y'all to take this as an example as to how you need to look at yourself and how you need to feel about yourself and how you need to lift yourself up and believe in yourself. Because that's the most important thing. At the end of the day, if you believe in yourself, that's all you need. That's all you need. Here, let me pull the picture up. 
I'll put it on the screen. I'm not going to show it on my phone while trying to hold the camera in the other hand. So if you look up here on the screen, this is when, obviously, I started Bubby Golf. I wanted to do everything. This was my summer after graduating. This was actually right before I met the guys. This was the summer of 2020. This was during COVID. But obviously, I had plans for what I was going to accomplish, what I wanted to pursue. And obviously, before I met all the guys and became a part of Good Good, I had an idea that I would have my own merch line, Bubby Golf merch. And this is one of the one of the one of the designs I had created. And if you look at it, it says, "I made this shirt when I felt lost, self doubt, stuck, alone, unsure, overwhelmed, broken." Today is eight sixteen twenty twenty, and I will drop this shirt when I hit a hundred thousand subscribers never give up and we're here now and i want y'all to just take now listen i'm not here talking like i'm something special because i'm not but take a look at that and understand that in that moment in time when i was feeling that low i felt all those things I felt all those things. That's how I felt. I never wavered on my belief in myself and where I was going and what I was doing. Understand that. No matter how bad I have, no matter how bad I have ever felt, I always knew who I was. I knew where I was going and I knew what I, what I wanted to be and what I was going to be. And that's all there is to it, y'all. I want y'all to carry that same energy too. Understand who you are and understand where you're going and understand who you are going to be. And don't let nothing in this life let you waver from that or change that. Yeah. Yeah. I want y'all to be the best version of yourself. I love you guys. I hope you guys got something out of this video. If you didn't get anything out of it, I hope you were at least entertained. Sitting here in this current moment in time, I don't even know what I've spoken about, to be honest. I've just sat here and talked to a camera for, I think, an hour or so. I don't really know, but I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'm really glad that I made this video and did it because before I started and when I first sat down to make it, I was getting a bit overwhelmed by it all thinking about everything I had to talk about and making sure in my head, I, I don't want to miss this. I want to talk about this. Ah, da, 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 ah. If I miss something, I miss something. That's how it is. I'm pretty sure I didn't miss something. I think that's going to be the video. I don't think I missed everything. I mean, woo, I don't think I missed anything. It feels so weird that it's like ending. We've been sitting here, I think, talking to the camera for an hour. I don't even know what I've talked about, to be honest. But like, there's one thing I want to leave you all with. If you've made it to this point in the video, I want to leave you all with just one thing. And I thought about this the other night while I was on my bike ride. I thought about this quote. And I don't know, I just kind of came up with this and I want to share it with y'all. And this is really in my life wholeheartedly, I believe so strongly in the power of decisions. Decisions is everything. And I just want to leave y'all with this. This is what I told myself on my bike ride. Sorry, <laughs> this is what I told myself on my bike ride. I said, there's only one thing that can destroy potential. And there's only one thing that can make you realize your fullest potential. And they're both the same thing. Decisions. It's everything. I mean, listen, I'm not here to be an inspiring person. I'm not here to be a motivational speaker or any of that. But that one at least hits home for me. It makes sense. As long as I go throughout the day and I keep doing the next right thing and making the right decisions, I'm going to be where I want to be. Same thing for you. If you guys keep making the right decisions and just tell yourself, am I doing the next right thing? You'll get to where you want to be. I promise you that. There's a lot of power in our decisions. And uh, yeah, I guess that's a wrap to the video. I hope y'all got something out of it. If you didn't get anything out of it, I hope you were entertained. I love you guys so much. I appreciate y'all so much. Thank you guys so much for this life. It is so blessed. And yeah, I love you guys. Just remember, if you're going through a tough time, this too shall pass. It always will. It'll always get better. I love you. I care about you. Be here tomorrow. Much love, y'all. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Peace.